I want to give you simple keys that will change the way you look at Scripture. This is going to be practical, not intimidating. And then you'll begin to experience the benefits of the Word of God, which are many. In this season, it's time to become committed, recommitted, and more committed to the Word of God than ever before. Now, you have a desire to know God's Word, but maybe you're not sure how to go about studying the Scripture. So, I want to show you the basics of how to do this. But first, I want you to write in the comment section these four simple words, I love the Word. If you're unashamed of the Word of God, if you want to go deeper in the Word of God, if you're ready to make a greater commitment to the Word of God, write those four simple words, I love the Word. Now, many believers struggle when reading the Scripture. They want to understand and then apply what they're reading, but many don't know how to do that. So I'm going to give you five keys to studying the scripture right here, right now. Number one is revelation. This is to involve the precious Holy Spirit in your study of the word of God. Let's go first to John chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 15 through 17. If you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Verse 26, but when the father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Now, when I first began to read the word of God, I was, I was a preteen. I wasn't even a teenager yet when I started to really become devoted to the Scripture. And I recall, of course, that as I read the Word, I became frustrated. There were moments that I would read chapters and chapters of the Scripture. And then halfway through my reading plan, I would realize I didn't understand anything that I just read. Or I would read verses 1 through 10, and by the time I got to verse 11, I would realize that my mind had wandered off and I wasn't really engaged in what I was reading. And maybe that's you. Maybe there's this struggle to really become committed to the word because you find that your mind is constantly wandering. Or maybe you are committed to the word of God, but you want to go deeper. In either case, whether you're a beginner or whether you know how to go deep into the scripture, we need the wisdom of God. So I recall that when I first got saved, I was reading through the scripture. I started in the book of James. That was really the first book of the Bible that I read that helped to set me on the right path. And then James chapter 1, verse 5, the scripture tells us that we can ask God for wisdom. And I remember reading that verse and going, this is me. I lack wisdom. That's describing me. And I lifted my hands. I said, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to help me understand the word. Because I would watch preachers and hear them expound upon the scripture with such eloquence and passion and revelation power. And I would listen to that and I would say, how did they get that from the scripture? Because when I look at the scripture, I don't see it. I didn't understand how to go about pulling out the gems of truth within the scripture. But I asked the Lord for wisdom. I asked the Holy Spirit to help me. And he taught me. The Holy Spirit was the one who inspired the scripture. Surely he can teach them. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read verses 20 and 21. The Bible says this, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says this, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here we see that the scripture, first of all, 2 Peter chapter 1, that the scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God, the scripture says. And then 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed or it proceeds from him, from his nature. It's of his spirit. So the Holy Spirit was the one who inspired every word in the scripture. And he can help you understand. Now, this does not mean that we don't need practical means of study. 
This does not mean that we don't have a part to play in our dedication of being diligent, of uncovering those truths. We must study. We must be diligent. We must be disciplined. But when you've considered all those things, please don't forget that ultimately it's the Holy Spirit who gives revelation. Information informs. Revelation transforms. So that's number one. You need revelation by the Spirit. If you don't have revelation by the Spirit, it's all just a practical approach. You're just being studious, but not necessarily spiritual. You're receiving information, but not revelation. Number two, you need dedication. And this means you have to have consistency in your devotion to Scripture. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 says this. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say... People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So in the book of Joshua, we see we're to study this book of instruction continually. So there's a consistency to it. There's a habit around it. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, we see that Jesus likens the word of God unto bread. Bread is something that sustains continually. You need to eat every day. And you have to, you have to devote yourself to the word of God with discipline. Remember, the Holy Spirit will give you the desire to know the word. The Holy Spirit will give you the desire to uncover revelation and truth. But you have to make the decision. You must implement the discipline. So you begin to pick up more than you realize as you read the word. And I understand because when I first began to read the scripture, it was all very confusing. I would come to the genealogies and wonder, is this really important? And yes, of course, even the genealogies are important. They chronicle something very important, which is, of course, well, we'll get into that another time, but the genealogies are important. The law is important. Everything in the scripture is important because it reveals facets of the nature of God. It reveals how God interacted with humanity. There are so many treasures of truth buried within the scripture waiting for you to uncover them. But again, I understand what that's like where you, you start reading and then you're just going, you're scratching your head and saying, I'm not quite sure what this is or what that means. And there's so many contradictions and so many people have so many different opinions. You can feel maybe so overwhelmed by the subject that it becomes, you know, you become uninspired you know, to read the word because of how, how much contradiction there is out there. But each time you read the Bible, you become more and more familiar with it. And that familiarity makes it easier to understand it. Repetition brings familiarity. Familiarity is the foundation of understanding. So, for example, the first time you go uh, through the book of Genesis, it may seem like there's a lot going on. But then as you read it again and again and again, you start to notice there are consistent themes. You start to notice there's a consistent rhythm to the way it's written. You start to notice that there are main ideas that get broken down into smaller ideas. And then you start to begin to grasp all of the different concepts, and you begin to realize, okay, I'm becoming familiar with it. Uh, for instance, another example. If someone is reading, for example, about the Passover for the first time, they'll learn about how God sent an angel of death over the land of Egypt and about how God protected the Israelites through the blood of the lambs. But once they are familiar with that story, they're now more likely to make the connection between the Passover lamb and Christ's crucifixion. So each time you read the word, your understanding will grow, even if just incrementally. So don't be discouraged if you read something and don't understand it. Just read it again. I don't want to cheapen the scripture by comparing it to something in pop culture. But for example, just as an analogy, when you watch a movie, let's say one that's a little complex, it has a confusing storyline. When you watch a movie the first time, you may leave that movie thinking, I don't really understand anything that happened. But then you watch it a second time, the setting is more familiar, the characters are more familiar, and now you're able to look out for little details that maybe help to better explain the story. And each time you watch that movie, you gain a greater and greater understanding of it. And again, I don't want to cheapen the Word of God by comparing it to a movie, but in the same way, as you repeat the patterns of Scripture, as you go through it again and again, each time you go through a book in the Bible, you become more familiar with it the names, the places, 
the stories, the themes, the cultural backdrops, all of those things begin to become more and more familiar. And again, familiarity is the foundation of understanding when you become familiar with what the scripture is saying. Number three, observation and interpretation. This is what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here the scripture is giving us a command to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Not to show off, not to debate, not to bully other people, but to show ourselves approved unto who? Unto God. Why? Because he is the Lord. We work for him. We are his servants. So we must come to the place where we're rightly dividing the word of God. We must apply, hear me now, we must apply practical study to our spiritual devotion. And here is where I see a contradiction. Many times, people who are a little more spontaneous or a little more, how shall I word this, inclined to the supernatural, they have an issue, generally speaking, with the rigid, foundational methods of studying the Scripture. And so... On one hand, you have the people, again, who are a little more inclined to the supernatural. They want experience. They want to feel God, know God, hear God. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But typically, and again, this is a generalization, that kind of person kind of mocks or looks down upon the idea of studying the word. They say things like, well, that's just head knowledge, or you're being puffed up with the word, or, or the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. That's an often misapplied scripture. But you get the idea. They're basically kind of snubbing, snubbing this idea of studying the scripture as if that academic pursuit or that, that discipline is somehow a contradiction to flowing in the Holy Spirit or being spiritual. And then on the other hand, we have Christians who are purely academic. It is all head knowledge. It's all about study. And, and they know about God, but they have very little experience with God. And they, likewise, they, they look down upon those who are a little more inclined unto the supernatural. But these two are not at odds with one another. It's not like the Spirit is fighting the Word. It's not like the Spirit is against the Word or the Word is against the Spirit. They work harmoniously together what doesn't work in harmony are the parts of our flesh that has an issue with either one of those. So the people who rely a little bit more on the intellect, they might have a little bit of trouble when it comes to surrendering to the move of the Holy Spirit, the experience of the Holy Spirit. And those who are a little more emotional might have trouble submitting their intellect to the disciplines that are commanded of us in Scripture. So we as believers must be devoted to the word. Just because you study the scripture doesn't mean you can't experience moves of God. In fact, those who know the word are very safely grounded in truth. They have a foundation upon which they can base their lives so that they're not just tossed to and fro, so that they're not just picking up every doctrine that comes along or hopping on every trend that seems to be doing well, but rather they have a solid foundation in the word of God. Now, the point of observation and interpretation is to uncover the intended meaning of Scripture. This means that we are looking in the Word of God for what is actually being communicated to us. And this is observation and interpretation. And really, the two are one. So when you're going through this, you're going to look at a few things. You're going to start with looking at the book. And in a moment, I'll have some visuals that if you're watching the video version of this, you can screenshot. If you're, if you're listening to the audio version of this, you can just go back over on YouTube and look for Bible Study for Beginners, Five Easy Keys, um, the one from this year, 2023, in December. And then you can screenshot those, and that will, of course, help you to uh, have some references there. So here's the way I look at it. You have macro, micro, macro. Big picture, little picture, big picture. I'll say it again. Big picture, little picture, big picture. So let's start with the big picture. This is how I approach the scripture. You want to understand the big ideas, break down the little ideas, and then zoom out and take a look at the big picture. I'll show you what I mean. Let's just take a look at it now. So number one, when it comes to observation and interpretation, which is key number three, you want to look at the book. And when it comes to the book that you're reading, you're going to notice that there are one of 
several categories that that book can fall under. So first, you have the law slash the Pentateuch. And this is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then you're going to have the Old Testament historical books, or some call them Old Testament narratives. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And then we have the wisdom slash poetic books, so the wisdom literature slash poetic books. You have the book of Job. Now, the book of Job could technically be counted as historical, but just because we want to put every book in a category, let's just for now put it in this category. You have the book of Psalms, you have the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. These are all wisdom literature slash uh, poetic books. And then you want to look at the prophets. Now, some divide the prophets into major prophets and minor prophets. And no disrespect is meant by that. That just is a reference to the size of the book. I remember uh, one time I, I, was in the, I, was in, I was in a class and my teacher who was running the, the, the Bible lesson didn't know that that was the categories that they placed them in. So when I said something to the effect, I think I said, like, is Jonah a minor prophet? She looked at me, she said, minor prophet? What do you mean minor prophet? She got all offended. I was like, I, and I didn't defend myself. I just left it as it was. But that's the way it's broken down categorically. The major prophets are the larger books. Minor prophets are the smaller books. So prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Um, and then you can also have some of the, the minor prophets like Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and so forth. And then you have the New Testament historical books slash narratives. And this is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And then you have the epistles. This is like Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Now, some divide even further the epistles and then the Pauline epistles. In other words, the epistles that everyone else wrote and the epistles that Paul wrote. And then some might put the book of Revelation in a category of its own. This is debatable. It's a hot topic. Uh, but Revelation, some say, is a category of its own. That's another subject for another time. But you get the idea. So the kind of book you're reading will have an impact on how the book is interpreted. For example, the way you study a historical book will differ from the way you study an epistle. In an epistle, I'm looking for teaching to apply directly to my life. In a historical book, I'm looking at how God interacted with people and I'm seeing truths about his nature. So it's not necessarily directly applicable, but there are things that we can glean from those books that become applicable to our everyday lives. Now, some might say, well, there's a difference between prescriptive and descriptive scripture. By that, they mean some scriptures are very instructional and some are just describing events that happened or interactions that happened between man and God. And I don't think that line is so harsh that you can't kind of have some crossover because who doesn't glean truths that are instructive from what we would call a descriptive text? So uh, that, that is often said. People say there's a difference between prescriptive and descriptive. That said, that's kind of put out there. It's a great rule of thumb, but it's not rigid. It's not scripture. You won't find that in the Bible. But it is a, it is a general good rule of thumb, or generally good rule of thumb, but I, I, don't, I wouldn't be too rigid with that. And next, you're going to want to look at the author. Who wrote the book? The purpose. Why did they write the book? The overall theme. What's the big idea here? The overall tone. What's the tone that they're taking with the people they're writing to? You want to look at historical and cultural backdrops. You want to look at the recipients. Who's receiving the letter? Who is, this, who is this record written for? So the author, the purpose, overall theme, overall tone, historical and cultural backdrops, and then the recipients. So this is good because studying this way keeps you from just making things up. Uh, for example, there, there's this idea that you can kind of take um, scripture and just be allegorical with it. Now, it's, to some degree, there's some room to do that in some places. But sometimes people just take things way too far. Like, for example... In the book of Acts, the story about the man falling out of the window while the apostle was preaching, and he dies and they raise him from the dead. Okay, what is that? That's a historical mention of a resurrection that took place within the time of the New Testament church, or the, the early church, I should say. 
Uh, but some will take that text and they'll say, okay, well, actually what this represents is the man falling out of the window represents your dreams that have died and God's going to resurrect them. Or they'll say like, well, he fell out of the window because he had one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And then that obviously led to his death. Now, it may be true that if you have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, that it'll lead to a sort of compromised spiritual state. But that's not at all what the text is communicating. Again, it's just a historical record of an amazing resurrection story. And that's good. That's great. So what can we glean from that? God is all powerful. God raises uh, the dead things to life, um, that even death uh, doesn't have authority over the power of Christ. Like, so we understand to that degree, we can glean some truth. But to take that and then to take every little detail of the story as if it has some very deep spiritual meaning, well, now you're forcing your meaning upon the text. And this is why I say that some Christians approach uh, the Bible as if they're reading a fortune cookie or even worse, like they're reading a horoscope and they're asking, what does this mean to me today? How does this apply to me? To be clear, you should apply the scripture to your life. To be clear, the scripture should speak to your life personally in a very personal way and even in a very detailed way. What I'm simply saying here is that we're not to take our meaning and try to force it upon the scripture. The job of the student, the job of the Christian student, the student of God's word is not to place their meaning on the scripture or place what they think God is telling them onto the scripture, but rather to take out from the scripture, extract the meaning that's already there. In other words, when the, you have to ask yourself this, when the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of that particular text to write what they wrote, what was it that he was intending to communicate? What did the Holy Spirit intend to communicate when he had that particular scripture written down or that particular story written down or that particular record written down, what was the Holy Spirit trying to communicate? What was the Holy Spirit trying to get us to see? Not what do I want to place on that? And so when you look at the scripture this way, this keeps you very safe. Uh, you're, you're safeguarded now against leaving the boundaries of, of scripture and now going into the area of imagination because we can be very imaginative with the way we look at the scripture. And this is why, for example, you don't see me teaching a lot of the things that are very popular to teach because I don't see some of these things in scripture. Now, I'm not here to say, look at me, I have it all good and I'm, I'm perfect and everything I teach is perfectly aligned. I'm sure that there are some things that I teach that maybe 20 years from now, as I continue to study the word, I'll go, oh my goodness, I didn't get that right, did I? But we have to be open to that. We have to be students. We have to be constantly learning and then humble enough to admit when we didn't get something right. And so if, however, we approach the scripture with these safeguards, looking at the intended meaning of the scripture, not what I intend it to mean, but the intended meaning of the scripture, then we prevent ourselves from going off the rails in that way. Uh, so then after you look at the entire, again, that, that whole backdrop, so author, purpose, overall theme, overall tone, historical and cultural backdrops, recipients, and so forth, now you're going to take a look at the chapters and verses. Now, keep in mind the chapters and verses were added later specifically for reference. So don't freak out about that. That is not considered adding to the Word of God or taking away from the Word of God because you're not changing the meaning of the Scripture. Those were just added for reference. And so typically, but not in every instance, those chapters and verses are broken down into thoughts, clear thoughts. So as you read, you can use the chapters for reference. You can use the chapters um, to help you more easily find scripture. You can use the chapters maybe even to help you reach goals in terms of your Bible reading. But please, as you read the scripture, read in portions of thoughts. Let the idea conclude before you close the Bible receive something from it before you move on with your day. So you get the chapters and verses, and next you're going to be looking at uh, the words. So you want to understand the terminology, the terms, and the context. When you take terms and words and abuse them or change them or, or misunderstand them, even, again, sometimes we unintentionally do these things, you end up with a lot of really strange doctrines. For example, I can name a couple. Universalism is a heresy. This idea that everyone is saved, whether they consciously receive Christ or not, or that everyone ultimately will be redeemed in eternity, that's just not what the Bible teaches. But universalism is fundamentally based on misunderstanding or misapplying or twisting 
the terminology surrounding eternity in heaven and hell in the afterlife. And so you ever notice when someone's pushing that heresy of universalism that there's going to be a lot of playing with the, with the Hebrew and with the Greek and with those terms that have to do with uh, periods of time and so forth, like olam, and I can go on listing several, but, but you get what I'm saying. There's, 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 very, there's a very confused way of going about it uh, that sounds right, but again, when you, when you begin to really do the research, you find that it's, it's actually an issue and it's a heresy. So some people do just enough research to be heretical, not enough research to find where that heresy is actually wrong. Another problematic doctrine, it's not necessarily heresy. I wouldn't label it as that. It's very dangerous. It's very harmful. It keeps people in bondage is this idea that Christians can have demons. Now, the idea that Christians can have demons, I want you to listen very carefully now what I'm about to say. You look at the doctrine, the false doctrine that Christians can have demons, and you're going to notice that the basis for this doctrine is always First, playing with the definition of daimonizomai, which is the Greek word for demonization. You look at that word and you look at that term, and you're going to find in order to build a case for Christian demonization, they always have to go back to that word and redefine daimonizomai. Daimonizomai, look it up in the Greek lexicons. Daimonizomai means to be possessed with a demon. And so what happens is there's this subtle shift. They'll take that word and instead of using it to mean what it means to be possessed with the demon, uh, they'll say things like, well, you know, demons don't own anything or the devil doesn't own anything. I'm thinking, well, what about John 8, 44, where Jesus said that the, the religious leaders belong to the devil? Um, you know, so you, they, they take little things like that and they'll redefine the term to instead of meaning demon possession, where the demon dwells in them and exhibits control over them, where the demon has them in its possession, they will redefine daimonizomai to mean, you know, it's just influence of demonic power in general. Or it's different degrees of demonic influence. You can have, you can, Damonizomai covers everything from spiritual bondage or temptation or torment all the way down to possession, and that's just not the case. How do you know that? You look at the scripture. You look at the context. You look at what the, in, the writers intended. You look at the writers of the Gospels, and you see when they use that word, they intended to communicate what we call demon possession. So that's just a couple examples. One is heresy, universalism. The other is just a problematic doctrine that creates a lot of perpetual bondage for people. And once you get down to the root of it, there is no more defending it. I mean, it really does end the debate when you study the word itself. Um, you can do this as a free tool online you can use. It's called Strong's Interlinear, Interlinear Bible. It's a free tool, but be careful uh, to try not to stretch things without understanding that. Even myself, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I reference a lot of the Hebrew and Greek scholars, but I myself am not one. But it still is a helpful tool. Just be careful with that um, because words do change meaning based on the context. For example, if I say um, the construction workers and the engineers built a bridge across the water, you picture one kind of bridge. But if I say, you know, their relationship was troubled, but then they built a bridge to each other. You're not thinking of a literal bridge there. Why? Same word, different context takes on a different meaning. So again, to recap, big picture, author, purpose, overall theme, overall tone, historical and cultural backdrops, recipients of the letter or the document or the record. And then you break it down further to chapters and verses. Those are sections. Again, those are there for reference. They're helpful for understanding how to break it up, maybe set goals, but those weren't there originally. Then you look down into the finer details, the words themselves. What did these mean? Now you're back at the details. And then you go back big picture again, and now you have a better understanding. You have a solid framework for understanding what's being communicated. And now you're safe from going off into heresy or going off into wild conspiracy theory-like doctrines that ultimately produce confusion and paranoia and more bondage and depression and anxiety. That's what happens when you don't understand the word. And more so confusion than anything, because people come up with some weird things, man, like strange doctrines. And, and if, if no one's there to check it, if, if you think, again, the, the word of God is like a fortune cookie where you just open it. Well, you know, they quoted a scripture when they said what they said, so surely it must be true. The question is not, can they quote scripture with what they share? The question is, can they quote scripture accurately and communicate what the scripture is communicating? And that goes for all different doctrines, all different places, from heresies to just uh, being off a little bit. And that's a safeguard for you that I think will be very helpful. 
Number four is meditation. Psalm chapter one, verses one through three. Let me pull up the scripture here. Psalm chapter one, verses one through three. All the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. So here the scripture is talking about meditation. Now this is important because this helps to keep the word of God in your mind. Now I know that when we hear the word meditation, that may freak some of you out, but I'm not talking about the new age concept of meditation. Worldly meditation says empty your mind, empty your mind. Why? So it can be filled with garbage. Godly meditation says fill your mind, fill your mind, fill your mind with what? With the word. What is meditation? It's simple. Meditation is repetition in thought. So as you do what I just gave you, you study, study, study. First, you ask for the Holy Spirit's help. That's going to be a big one. Then you have to be consistent in the word every day. Familiarize yourself with that text. Even if you don't understand what you're reading, keep reading again and again and again. It'll become more and more familiar. The number three, observation and interpretation. And those two empower one another. And then comes meditation. Now that you've received the truths, you've taken a bite of the meal, now you have to let it digest. If reading and hearing the word is eating, then meditation is digestion. Let me say that again. If reading and hearing the word is eating, then meditation is digestion. In other words, when you hear the word, when you read the word, it's like you're taking a bite out of a spiritual meal. But only when you meditate on it, repeat it in your mind again and again and again, only then does it become digested so that the nutrients of the word can help to fill the spirit or your spirit is already filled, but to help give the spirit influence over the other areas of your life. Now, number five is application. This is so important. What's the point in knowing the word receiving the revelation, being dedicated to it, being accurate with it, meditating on it, if you're not going to live it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 12 says, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. So Jesus said that what little understanding they had would be taken away. Why? Because they didn't do anything with it. So application is a part of studying God's word because it causes you to experience the word. Think about, for example, a pilot that's being trained. They can sit in that simulator all day, but eventually they're going to have to fly a real plane if they want to get their license. In the same way, you can read and study the word. That's great. And you need to do that. I stress the importance of that. So don't hear what I'm not saying. It's not just experience. You have to have it based on the word. So you, you receive the word in that way, but application, now you're living it, that is a part of studying God's word because it causes you to experience the word. Living the word keeps your fellowship with the Holy Spirit unhindered. And if you don't apply the word, your hunger for the word will dwindle. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For... If you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Again, that's James chapter 1, verses 20 to 25. I'm going to pray with you now, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to stir within you a hunger for the word. Now, I know it's tempting at the end of the lesson to start clicking on other things, but I want you to allow this to be sealed now. Let's agree together in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are stirring that hunger for the word. Make us students, I pray. Give us a passion, a fire, a zeal to know you and understand you through your word. Will you just thank him right now? Thank him that he gave us the word. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the revelation of who we are. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for inspiring the scripture. Now I pray, Lord, you would give us that desire for it. Help us to understand it. 
Cause us to be committed, I pray. Help us to remove distraction. We want to go deeper in your word, Lord. Take us to higher places, we pray. In Jesus' name, I want you to say it because you believe it. Don't forget to also, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like. That actually helps to spread the teaching even further. And I really want to stay connected with you. So make sure you subscribe to my channel and make sure you also click that notification bell when you do subscribe. Because if you subscribe without the notification, sometimes you get notices, sometimes you don't. But if you click the notification bell, then for the most part, you'll receive those notices. And now I want to invite you to be a part of what God is doing through this ministry, through your financial support. I'm asking you right now to consider supporting the work through either a single donation or a monthly partnership. All of it goes to help us advance the kingdom of God through the spreading of the gospel. Our ministry has a very simple, focused vision. Spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world through the power of the Holy Spirit via events and media. So all of the media, the content, we release it for free. All of the events that we do, say for a few specialized events, they're free. We don't charge people to come in and hear the word of God to be saved. We don't charge people to come in to receive healing and deliverance. All of that is donor supported, and that's where we need your help. So if you've been blessed by this ministry, you heard something that blessed you, encouraged you, you received a revelation that transformed the way you looked at prayer, the Holy Spirit, or spiritual warfare, maybe you received salvation, healing, or deliverance through this ministry, and it is God's ministry, it's not mine, I'm just a steward, but maybe you've been impacted. Will you do your part now and pay it forward? I know times out there are really rough. I know things get very scary, especially when you hear the news of collapse of this and the rise of that. And of course, if you pay attention too much to those things, it can begin to disrupt your spirit. But remember, we go by faith, not by fear. So I'm gonna challenge you to walk by faith and see if God won't do a miracle. See if God won't provide. Give your support to this ministry and I believe God will return it back to you. So give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Become a monthly supporter by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. It really does make a difference. Maybe you've been on the fence. You're like, I think about partnering, or maybe you've opened up the donation link. You, you, you saw the form, maybe even typed in some information, and then you just went, nah, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, that happens, and sometimes we can be a little afraid. Sometimes we're a little hesitant. There's that, that little, little part in all of us. Sometimes we can be a little stubborn, right? We're like, oh, I don't know. If that's you, you've been considering it, you've been praying about it, you've been thinking about it, now is the time to act. We have great momentum at this ministry right now. Expansion, rapid. Growth, rapid. Favor, immense. Get involved with what God is doing. One more time, single gifts, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Monthly support, davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. We could really use that monthly support because it helps us to plan for the future. You can give a gift of any amount in any currency from any country. I'm just asking that you try our form first. And if the form doesn't work for you, then and only then switch to YouTube or Facebook giving. YouTube and Facebook take quite a chunk out. So try the website first. We take cryptocurrency, stock donations, all different kinds. Again, just go to the website. And I so appreciate your support. Thank you for standing with me. I love you. I appreciate you. I pray for you. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.